we are continuing our My Crazy Family message series, and today we're talking about parenting. And we're talking about what it means to parent today, because obviously the world is always changing and, and what that looks like. And when we were planning this a few months ago, uh, we were talking, and, uh, and Eric realized he was going to be out of town. And he said, hey, Chad, I want you to, to, to lead this time. And, uh, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got two kids, and, uh, and he sees that I'm a good parent, and so that's why he wants me to lead. And then he kept going. Yeah, you're laughing. He kept going, and he said, and we're going to have two family counselors for you to interview. And then I thought, oh, no, he just thinks I'm like Oprah. So I'll take it. I really wanted to be like, you know, look under your chairs. You get a car. You get a car. But uh, I asked Hardy if we had the money for that, and he said we were like $20 short, so we couldn't do it. All right. Keep up, folks. All right. So anyway, so today we are going to be talking about parenting. You know, Charles read that verse earlier about impressing these commandments on the hearts of your children everywhere you go, uh, telling them about that, teaching them. And we know how important it is uh, to raise our children the way that God wants us to raise them. So today we're going to be, we've compiled uh, some questions, some of the top questions that you guys had and some other folks had about parenting today. And we have got two guests that are going to be joining us who are experts in this field. The first is Dr. Klein Johnson. Uh, he has over 48 years of family counseling experience, and he works for the Montgomery Baptist Association uh, as well as with Baptist Health. And then also we have Donna McCullough here with us today, who has worked for over nine years uh, at the Forest Park Ministry Center, uh, working with families and helping folks work through things. And so anyway, I want you guys, Vaughn Forest Church, to welcome our two guests this morning as they join us, Dr. Klein and Ms. Donna. You guys come on out and have a seat on the couch. Now, I told them earlier, normally when I'm in the room with some therapist and there's a couch, I'm laying on it telling them about my problems. Uh, but today I think we'll skip that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank Appreciate y'all being here. Yeah, have a seat. So parenting, right? Right. Super simple subject. This no. should take what, like five minutes? Absolutely oh, okay. not. All right. So a pretty big deal. Like when we look in the Bible, God refers to himself as our father and us as right. his children. So literally the, the picture that we have of our relationship with God is, is a parent-child Relationship. relationship. Right. And so for us as, as parents, for those of us, if, whether you have children, whether you want to have children, whether you have children in your life, I think everyone has at least some little ones of friends or family running around. And we've heard it takes a village to raise, right. raise a child. And so, but, but particularly as parents, obviously the idea of family is a big deal to God. The family unit is the basis of everything in the Bible. Right. Old Testament and New Testament, and then secular-wise, it's the same thing. Every society is based upon the unique family unit, and therefore, that's where we transmit our Christian values in the home setting and the verse in Deuteronomy, as well as passages in the New Testament tells us to discipline Discipline is to learn, and that is our role as parents is to ensure that we teach and our children learn Christian values, Christian principles to guide their actions. Mm. It, and that kind of leads into our first question, and Donna, I'll, I'll ask you this. What do you think, in, in your years of counseling experience, what do you think is the most important thing that we can do as parents to raise our children? Well, one of the most important values that you as, a, as an adult parent should have is a personal relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, our children, because they have very concrete minds, they see, just as you uh, said earlier, the whole concept of our Heavenly Father that's an abstract concept to them. They don't see a heavenly father, yeah. but they see you as their dad. Yeah. And so that is, that is their visual of what God is. And so it's very important that although we're not perfect, um, it's very important that we try to exemplify godly values in order to be able to, to share that with our children. Dr. Johnson, would you like to add anything on to that? I think the big thing is consistent daily Christian living. Mm -hmm. And that 
and the old phrase, it is caught as it is taught rather than just verbal instruction. Mm -hmm. So not just uh, teaching or taking to church, but, but living it out. Living it out okay. on a daily basis, modeling Christian behaviors. Which is way harder to do than just teach, right? Right. Right. Now, do you, do you, see, do you see that in your counseling uh, parents that, that struggle with that? Is, that? is that common or am I by myself in that? Very, very common. And that is where those internal conflicts come from the parent. Mm. I know I should be doing this. How can I change what I do? And then the biblical model is think upon these things. We change our thinking. That leads to a change in action. Gradually changes our feelings. The Bible doesn't talk about feelings. We change thinking, action, those are behaviors. Hmm, very interesting. So Don, how, how important is it to balance, and this is a little bit of a, of a shift in direction, how important is it to balance time with our children and time in our marriage? Well, the best gift you're going to give your child is a stable home. Hmm. And um, we know that, that that's not the case in a lot of our, uh, in a lot of our homes, but... but but the really most basic need that a child has is that of security. So ideally you would have mother, father on the same page, um, giving each other respect and regard. Every, every family appears differently. You have different schedules. There, there's no way to have a pat answer or like a formula that says you'll spend X amount of time as a couple as opposed to um, with the children. But you just need to, the, the children need to know that you're on the same page and that you regard each other with respect. That it presents a sense of security, and that is the very basic thing, very first need that a child has when they come into this world. So, right, so it's important for your children to see a husband and a wife, or mother and a father, as a husband and wife, on the same team, working together, not mm -hmm. divided. Now, Dr. Johnson, one of the things we do know is that 50%, according to statistics, of marriages end in divorce. So what would you say to some of those families that have been through that? That is still correct. We are still averaging about 50% divorce rate. The big thing is respect for the parent. Obviously, there were differences or they would not be apart. But respect never downgrade, degrade the other parent. You have two homes, most of the time with some type of visitation. The other is we have two sets of rules. You're a smart young person. What we do at this house is this set of rules. What you do over at the other parent's house is that set of rules. We never use the child, regardless of what age, to ask what's going on at the other house or to be a messenger. You communicate what is best for that particular child. Also, most young children have the same emotional reaction to divorce as that of a death because it is a death of a relationship and the unity that the parents had is no longer there. Hmm. So obviously, you know, again, plan A, stability. We right. want to have stability, but there is still hope for stability even oh, in... Oh, of course there's hope for stability. And that's, what's, that's one of the most important things. But you develop a lifestyle that is unique, that meets the needs of each child. Hmm. Each child's needs are different. One parenting formula will never work because we still have not learned how to separate how much is nurture and how much is genetic. The answer is yes, both are involved. We take our child where they are at every stage of development and work individually with that child. Right. 
Donna, how important would you say that it is for uh, spouses to make each other a priority? Is it, is it that the child comes first and, and everything else bows down to the child, or is it more important to make your spouse a priority? Well, because you need to be on the same page, you have to have some priority for each other. Um, when you say make it a priority, um, again, every family is different. Uh, you may not have physically the time to make that priority, but you do have to have, you can have the attitude that, um, that you're both regarded as, um, that, that I care about your feelings, I care about, about um, how you feel about certain things, I want to be on the same page with you in terms of how we present um, our home, our rules, our, you know, our things that we do together. Even, even if once or twice a week as a family you can gather together and go to McDonald's. I mean, even if you can just do something together as a family and that a child knows that they're an, an in, in, intact part of an intact system. And why is that so important to the child? Again, just the stability factor? Because that is the very basic need. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we want a child, let's, let's talk about our, our Christian values and how we want our children one day to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, we want them to know the security of knowing that relationship. We want, if we're going to be the first picture that that child sees of what a, a parent is, what Heavenly Father is, um, then we want them to be secure in that. And that really is the basic need that all other needs are, are mm. built upon. Right. So, Dr. Johnson, let me ask you this. How much of our actions shape the actions of our, of our children and, and impact their future? The parent influence typically from a Christian perspective, is the single most influential element in a child's development. That is not always the case, but that is one of our Christian ideals, that it is present there. Helping them to grow in their spiritual life so that it is internalized with them and they react to their Christian teachings when they're making multitudes of individual decisions. And we prepare them for it before they face many of those decisions. And it's a natural progression of spiritual growth at the child's developmental level. So what we're doing now to prepare children for later is how they will react totally. to external environments later. Totally. Oh, okay. Um, now, let, me, let me ask this. Do you, do you find, Donna, in your work that the way that a parent has acted, what, the things that they have done, that that, that that passes on to their children in the next generation? Well, it really does. It can, it can impact negative and positively. Sometimes a, parent, a child can, can witness something and say, I'm not going to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but other times, uh, more, than, more than not, a child will say, um, well, this is how mom did it, or this is how dad did it. And so that we learn uh, responses to crises in our lives by what we observe uh, in our families. And let me just say, too, that, that we're not perfect. None right. of us are perfect. We're going to make mistakes. So one of the greatest values we can teach our children is honesty mm. and admit when we've made a mistake. So even when we make a mistake, to own it to our children, oh, to model that for them. That's, that's really important. Yes. Wow. All right, well, let me ask you this. This was a big question uh, that we had. And, and so I realized the other day, later this month, my oldest daughter is going to turn eight. And I had, I was driving, I had a mini panic attack because I thought, oh my goodness, in eight more years, she's going to be driving. <laughs> and it freaked me out because I'm going, I'm going to have to pay for her car. I'm going to have to pay for insurance. And oh my gosh, I'm going to have to trust her out on the road. And, and, I, and my immediate reaction was just to go, nope, not doing any of that. We're just going to lock her back up in the room and never let her out. But the question is, is where, especially with teenagers, but really of children of all ages, because with, with technology and the internet and everything, you know, children, it seems like, are becoming more and more aware of the world around them at a younger and younger age. Where is the right balance of control and trust with our children, especially with teenagers? Realistic expectations have to be set at every level. And electronics is one of our major, major issues of 
going to sites that are totally inappropriate for their maturity level, age level, whatever. Therefore, the parental controls have to be in place. We trust them with those things that they have the capacity to be responsible for. Mm -hmm. We trust them to carry this to the next door neighbor. We trust them to do this, but we prepare them in advance, give them what our realistic Christian values are. And therefore, it is not a, you use a prevention model rather than a punitive model. Our goal is self-control, self-discipline, and of course the term discipline comes from disciple, which is to learn. Mm -hmm. We use the family unit as a teaching basic unit. When you and I were talking earlier and you mentioned this whole idea of discipline versus punishment, I think punishment. it was. Can, right. can you expound on that a little bit? Punishment too often satisfies the parent's anger over a situation and it makes the parent feel good, hurts the child usually, but as far as it's changing or shaping the behavior pattern, it usually does not. Hmm. In the New Testament, uh, Ephesians 6.4 even speaks to that. Parents do not provoke your children to anger. And anger is a threat and loss of control. So the verses of that is discipline. And what, you know, Donna, let me ask you this. What are, what are some ways to, to um, set your kids up to win, to set it up for trust, to set it up to where you don't have to feel the need to, to control quite as much at an earlier age so that at a later age it's not as big of an issue? Because what I hear you saying is that by working with our children when they're younger, right. by setting boundaries there, by holding the line there, by setting them up to win, what are some ways to, to really do that? One of the things that I, I've talked with parents about is, is allowing children at a young age to start making choices. Um, for example, uh, you might have um, three sets of clothing out and say, you choose which one you're going to wear today. You might have um, two types of cereal out. Which one are you going to eat today? It, it, something very, very basic, very simple. But start empowering those children young, at a young age to make very simple choices. Um, you know, cutting, cutting the apron strings um, I always tell people it's like major t surgery. It hurts. <laughs> and, um, but I, I, I always go back to, not just in my experience as a counselor, but even as, as a teenager myself. And I remember the days when, uh, you know, I, I, there was a very uh, found, firm foundation laid in terms of discipline. But as a teenager, I had a dad who would say, uh, if I would ask to do something, it might be something kind of simple in my eyes. Um, but he would, might say, you know how I feel about that. Uh, I've made that clear, but it's your decision. Mm -hmm. And if I chose to do it anyway, there would be consequences, natural consequences of that, um, that decision if it turned out that it was not a wise decision. But, and that's a very painful thing for a parent to do, but it's very necessary. It's hard necessary. To, to, to come hands off and let them, but what I hear you saying is, is we have to, uh, let them fail sometimes. Is that yeah. correct? Give them the freedom to fail. Wow. Freedom That's to very, fail very and difficult. accept the consequences of their decision. Right. Wow. A good decision at any age level is when we are willing to accept the consequences of it. And we even talk about those in advance. If you do this, then this will probably happen. If you do this, this will happen. You want to go visit so-and-so, you can stay X number of hours, need you to be back home. If you're not, then the consequences for three days, week, whatever, you're grounded. So setting those, those boundaries those up early and teaching from a young age. At a young age, being consistent and continuing with them. 
Okay, so shifting gears just a little bit, I know uh, we talked about this in the first service, how um, in today's day and age, whether it's uh, both parents working or some sort of uh, financial situation, how a lot of grandparents are having to step in and really help with, with grandchildren. And in some cases, uh, some grandparents are having to step in and be the primary caregivers of these right. children and, and, and fill the roles of the parents. Are you guys seeing a, an increase in that? Oh, oh yes. tremendous increase. Uh, Don and I both uh, are aware of this and deal with it every week that comes. And nationwide, we're dealing with about 20% of grandparents are functioning as parents. 20%? 20%. Wow. And so, what what are what are some what are some reasons for that, and what are what are some things that these grandparents can do? Because is it that the parents can't or won't, or what what what's what's the situation? There? Well, there really are a multitude of reasons. Um, oftentimes, there's there's an economic condition where there might have been a divorce, and and so a, a parent has to move in with his or her parents with their children, or uh, there might be that the, uh, an adult parent has been uh, incarcerated. And then the grandparent has to take over. It might just be, it might be a death. Uh, it might be that um, there's addiction issues. Uh, there, there's a multitude of reasons why uh, a grandparent usually has to step in. And, and we're seeing, you know, 20 percent, um, that's like 2.7 million grandparents in this country that are raising their grandchildren. So what, what resources are out there to help some of these grandparents who are having to, to parent again? Well, in, in, we're here in Montgomery uh, at the Ministry Center, uh, Forest Park Ministry, we do have a, a Grandparents as Parents support group. Mm -hmm. And there are support groups that, like that throughout the nation. And uh, it's basically a place for grandparents to come. They can vent. They can learn. They can learn from each other. Sometimes we have scenarios where we um, have something that happened perhaps um, it, hypothetically at school or or on the playground or something and and we give input uh, from each perspective um, mainly it's a very safe place it's a very confidential group so that grandparents who find themselves in that particular um, cir circumstance can come and um, be able to receive support and if someone was here and they wanted to get involved with something like that, what would be the best way of contacting the, this Calling group? the Ministry Center, which is 334-269-5726. That's, that's great that you guys do that. Now, assuming a more uh, traditional role uh, of a grandparents, where parents are there, what, Dr. Johnson, do you think is, uh, what's the greatest role that a grandparent can play in the life of a grandchild? To be a friend to them, to be a confidant, but yet maintain the integrity of the rules that their parents have set. The grandparent is making a major, major error when they say, now I will let you stay up, or you don't have to eat your vegetables, or we will sneak and go to the pool when your parent tells me that you're not to go swimming because you've got an ear infection. Right. That is undermining the parents, and that is one of the negative things that too often grandparents do. Positive, we're able to provide additional items for them to do a confidant that they can trust, but the consistency of the whole family dynamics and unit has to be maintained. Well, and we spoke earlier about how uh, our actions, our children will, will follow those actions. I have sure. to imagine that even grown children, what they see modeled by their parents as grandparents is what then they will carry out when they become That's grandparents. True. That is so, definitely true. So as parents, we always have to be reminded that no matter what age we are, our children are watching us and they're going to model what we do. Is that, right. would you say that's correct? Totally correct. Man, that's, that's crazy. All right. So speaking, speaking of spoiling children, because I remember going to my grandmother's house and, you know, and loving it because she made cookies and obviously I had too many of them, but here's my next question. All right. So 
where is the right balance between giving our kids what they want and what we know they need? Like, for example, I've got two little girls, and I'm not going to lie, I am wrapped around their finger. You know, if we go to a store and my daughter, she's learned what to say. So, man, I sure wish I had that toy. And I'm like, well, we can get it, you know. And my wife, of course, is going, no, because she doesn't love them as much as I do. And so, no, um, don't y'all tell her I said that, by the way. No, 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 no. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But, but no, but for me, I always want them, I almost equate that with me giving them stuff with them being happy, whereas that's not the truth at all. So where no. is the right balance of giving? Because we do want our kids to have things, and we do want them to have toys and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, we don't want them to be spoiled. So where is the right balance between giving them what they want versus what they need? Well, the basic needs first have to be met. Right. And then we talk about, again, as Donna mentioned earlier, choices. Letting children make choices. We cannot get a toy today, but if you save your allowance or if you don't do so-and-so or you continue to do these chores at home because every family member has got to contribute to the family life of that home, then we will let you select a toy, and that is technical term, real simple, that is delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. right. A baby, instantaneous gratification, and I'm afraid to say some adults have never made that transference from instantaneous gratification to delayed. And that is a developmental stage that has to be evolved and taught right. for every child. So Donna, would you say that it is important for our children to hear the word no? And if so, why? <laughs> you know, there is what we call a holy no. And that means, really and truly, it is the best thing for sometimes to, to tell someone, no, and here's why. Right. Um, you said here's why. Do you find that explaining it uh, yes. is a big part of that? And yes. why, why? Why? Because being part of it, because, because I said so doesn't always work when right. we're talking about respecting each other in a family unit. Now, there, granted, Parents need to, I mean, children need to know that the parent is, is to be respected and the parents' uh, rules are to be respected. But, you know, God created every one of us uniquely and all in his image, and he gave every one of us the ability to have our own way of thinking and our own thoughts and actions and make our own decisions. And so, you know, to, to let a child know that I know you want that and I understand that you want that, but here's, here's how this needs to come down. And um, just to, to teach them the, the at work ethic, right. the, to teach them, um, you know, as, as Dr. Johnson said, uh, delay gratification. You, you can't have everything instantaneously. You know, um, those are very, very important values for a child to learn. And, and do you find that that helps them relate a little bit more to the, to the world around them and also answer some of the questions about, you know, because there are bad things in this world, and we do know that, that God, you know, causes it, allows it. Do you find that, that by learning no, and sometimes we can't have what we want, do you find that that helps understand the nature of God a little sure, bit better? you've got to set limits, and God sets limits on us, right. whether we adhere to them or not. Right. And that is part of your role as a Christian parent, to help that child regardless of what age, to internalize those Christian values, not out of fear, but to internalize and make those values their own. Mom, I did so and so. You would be proud of me. I said absolutely not of downloading this app onto my telephone. Because no one here has ever experienced that, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, a couple more questions, and we're, we're going to wrap up. This, this is an interesting one. This is one that we had a lot. I remember when my oldest was born, she was super compliant, even as a baby. You know, we, we thought, man, this parenting thing is not that hard. You know, she goes to sleep. We tell her no. She obeys. This is, this is not a problem. 
And then we had our second child. And she's a lot like me. And she's more stubborn than I am, which is an accomplishment. And we would literally, we, we were trying to do the, I think the baby wise thing where you let them just cry it out and, and you know, and, and oh, we're not going to go in there. But at four in the morning after crying all night, we're going, how does she still have this energy? This doesn't make any sense. So, so my question is, what do you do for yourself, but also for your marriage and for your child when you are tired of fighting with your children to try to get them to do the right things? What, what do you do, Donna? Well, one of the things you do is you try not to let them see you tired. Right. Because they will pick up on that right. very easily and know that they can wear you down. So um, earlier we were talking, and, and Dr. Johnson said to choose your battles. Choose so, your battles. Yes. And make sure that um, you stand your ground. And if there's a time when you feel like you're just exhausted, you step back. You know, you might even say, I can't, enter, enter, I can't even enter into that conversation right now. I'm going to step back. You take a deep breath, and um, you pray through that. Right. Choose your battles. What, what do you mean by choose your battles? Every little thing is not going to be perfect. I've never seen the perfect family or the perfect household or the perfect child. Hmm. So you select those major issues that are values to you and your family. We make sure they are aware of those. And in simplistic terms, we try to go with a prevention model and preparation model instead of repairing or a punitive model when something has happened. So what I hear you saying is, is that picking the fights that are worth right. fighting and then standing your ground once you have found that, but, but having the wisdom and the discernment to know, hey, maybe this isn't worth the knockdown right. drag out. But when it's time for the knockdown drag out, and I'm assuming, Donna, you can probably comment on this, for a husband and wife to be unified, for parents right. to be together Absolutely. when that battle comes. Is that, is that, I would imagine that's super yes, important. Yes, and that's one of the important parts about, about protecting your, your relationship. And even if you're no longer married, to be on the same page with, with those basic values that you want your children to learn. Okay, the last question. Oh, sorry. Wife have got to be together God up above, come down, children at this level. They cannot relate to each other with the husband over here, the wife over here, and they communicate to each other between the children. So it kind of goes back to that stability thing. Mm -hmm. A unified force, stability. Exactly. Gotcha. All right, last question, and then, then we're going to wrap up. Um, there are probably a lot of parents who are here, maybe are watching online, who have children, maybe they're, maybe they're younger, maybe teenagers, maybe they're grown, that have, that have rebelled against God or not walking, not tracking with God. What would, what would you say, uh, Dr. Johnson, what would you say to, to those parents whose children are no longer walking with God? Maintain connectivity, the relationship with them. There is always hope, and the Bible again tells us Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That is a goal, but the relationship, you will always be my son. Mm. Regardless of what you do, I may not approve of, but maintain that relationship. They know at that level what your values are, you know what I believe, but I want us to keep a relationship. That's your number one goal. Right. Donna, do you find that those values, when imprinted on those children at a young age, even when they rebel and run away, do you find that those values stick with them, and do, does, it ever, does it ever manifest later in life? Yes. In fact, um, that very scripture has, has been on my refrigerator for over 20 years, wow. and the, the word old is highlighted and in bold and underlined because you, not everybody's the same. And our soil is different, it's just like the parable. But it's a seed that we planted as parents in our children. And that seed at some point will germinate. Right. And, and uh, you will see, but and there is hope. You will yep. see some sort of... Well, and you know, Scripture tells us that it's the kindness of the Lord that calls right. us to repentance. And so what I hear you saying is, 
is that by maintaining that relationship, by maintaining that kindness, we as those who right. are the picture of God, that they will see that and that it is that kindness of, of God, of Christ, that will draw them to repentance. Exactly. Wow, that's just incredible. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. I'm going to pray for, for our families and, and for all of our parents and, and for those that want to be parents or any of you that know children. We're going to pray, uh, and then we're going to wrap up here in just a moment. So you guys join me in prayer. Father, we just love you. God, we thank you that we can call you our father, our daddy. And God, we thank you that you are the perfect picture of a parent. And God, we just pray for all of the families in our church and the River Region, God, and just and beyond, Lord, that you will just guide us, that you will give us wisdom, that you will direct us. Um, and God, that you will just, uh, just shower us with your grace, Father God, as we just seek to raise children who are hungry for you and who seek after you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.